All right. So now we are moving at the last leg of the API Days Live India. And next up, aligning with the connected products theme, I have a fantastic speaker, Rohit Paneja, founder and CEO of Decentral, who will be sharing a very interesting topic and presentation, transforming Indian private banking with APIs. It also tees up nicely with the previous session, which was delivered by Vikas, because here Rohit will be sharing a bit more context from the Indian private banking system side. So Rohit, very warm welcome to you at API Days Live India. We are really honored to have you and both uh, as a speaker. So just checking, we can see your slide. So everything is working fine. Uh, the stage is all yours. With respect to any of the questions we might have, we will take it at the end of your session. So sure. all sure. yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tejas. Good to be on the show again. Um, so as part of the Singapore conversation, you know, uh, a few weeks back, and uh, yeah, yeah, that one was uh, amazing as well. Um, yeah, so you know, as we just highlighted at a very high level, um, what I'll be covering uh, during the next you know fifteen twenty minutes will be how uh, the private sector, right, and on the private side, of course, we mean uh, the consumers, the retail side, right, um, and the private banks, right. So how is the private sector, uh, specifically on the banking side, right, uh, going to change from an API perspective? Like how, what role will the APIs play uh, on the private sector side? Yeah. Awesome. So um, let's get started. Let's talk about, a bit about, you know, on the, the categories, right? What kind of categories first exist uh, when we speak about private banking? Um, I think the first major category, right, that would come to your mind would be, of course, the private companies, right? So most of the people, including us, right, we work in a private sector company. Um, then there, is, there are these new categories that are uh, emerging very rapidly. And uh, for those of you who are really you know, paying close attention to the FinTech market or in general, the startup market, you realize that these categories are catching up right, from a growth perspective in terms of the speed of growth as compared to what the typical IT sector has seen. Uh, and that is expected right? in early stages of companies, definitely the number of companies plus the company's growth rate, both are extremely fast. So um, let's take like you know gig economy. Now a typical gig economy employer, right? So it could be your Airbnb, for example, um, right? Or of course, and a person who is permanently uh, employed, permanently in the sense like he's essentially deploying all his time on Airbnb only, or whatever time he wants to invest, right? And he's deriving his sole income from Airbnb, and he might have some other avenues as well. And I'm sure you would know of a lot of these people. Right? Then there are uh, you know people who are just doing reselling, for example. Right? I'm sure you would have heard of you know people who are reselling on apps like Misho. Right? So these are the people who really fall under your gig economy sector, right? From uh, an employer side and then the employee side. Uh, now these are not really traditional employees, you know, in the typical sense of the word. And uh, if these employees or I mean uh, if these people right really go to the banks or financial institutions, they face a lot of hurdles. Uh, specifically in terms of availing instruments like getting a bank account, you know, or availing a simple loan, house loan, anything. Um, and the sole reason is because most of the banks uh, and you know the legacy institutions have been used to a certain structure, right, of giving that financial instrument. So if you look at a credit card, you know, uh, like filling out form uh, or a loan form that you fill out at the bank, you will notice that they typically ask you for you know anywhere from like three months, six months, twelve months, a couple of years of salary, right? Uh, salary slips, IT returns, you know, so on and so forth. Now, the people who are really working in these new avenues, gig economy is a great example, right? You have gamers, right? people who are deriving their sole income from gaming. Um, you know, you have people who are essentially working in the wealth management, right? They essentially are uh, people who are freelancing for somebody else, right? Uh, as a wealth manager, or they are a dedicated wealth manager from a financial institution. Then, in that case, they might be employed by them. Right. Then you have you know people who are developing you know, new and new institutions like neo banks. Uh, now neo banks, of course, if you look at the category of neo banks, they're white, right? There are people who are developing neo banks for tier two, tier three economy. Then there are neo neo banks that are focused on the blue collar workforce. There are neo banks that are also focused on gig economy workforce, by the way. And then there are these aggregators, right? Zomato, Swiggy, Olas, right? Which also employ a lot of people who would not really qualify as an employee in the traditional sense of the word. Now. For these guys to really avail these banking instruments becomes a challenge, right? So this is this is exactly the thing that is changing. Uh, I would say, you know, um, without a lot of people above the age of thirty or forty realizing it. Of course, most of us who are, you know, um, 
in the young age bracket or the millennial age bracket, we tend to notice it extremely fast. Uh, and this is going to, like I would say, create a massive change in the way private banking works, uh, not just in India. Right? Of course, we're focusing on India right now, but pretty much across the globe. So um, I would like you all to really you know, probably think on these categories you know, um, as we go uh, forward into your respective careers, your respective, you know, uh, like whatever you're doing right now in your life, uh, to think on what impact you can have right, in these fast running categories. Let's take a look at you know um, what happens when some of these companies, some of the names that I took, right, uh, Zomato, Ola, Squiggy, on the Aggregate side, you know, uh, Airbnb on the gig economy side, any freelancer company, right, uh, on the gig economy side, uh, there are numerous examples of them, you know, in India. Let's take a let's take a look from their perspective. What happens when they try to integrate with a private banking, you know, uh, institution, which could be any of your you know private banks in the country. This is where they face. You know the classic struggle of banking infrastructure, uh, and even though you know, as we saw in the last presentation, uh, the banks are trying their bit to really adopt uh, like a digital infrastructure as much as possible, and a digital journey as much as possible, like the entire uh, journey right from the start of the conversation to the production time, it hasn't really materialized. Um, and I won't really go into that debate of you know why, uh, like why banks do not have the capability. That is the fundamental belief that we have. Uh, and I have as a, I mean, personally, uh, and we, of course, as an organization, uh, that would be probably a different topic itself. But yes, generally, if you ask the companies, like the real ground reality, when they start integrating with a bank, um, specifically speaking about India right now, this is what it is, right? Um, the onboarding is broken, APIs are fragmented. Most of the APIs that are listed out on the portal, uh, they're just the namesake, documentation is incomplete, right? You have to coordinate with multiple departments, right? Um, and this is universal, by the way. It's not that, you know, if you're a startup, you'll face it differently. And if you're a corporate, you'll face it differently. No, you'll face these struggles no matter what. Right? The time taken, yes, will be different, right? So a startup might finish it in three to four months, right? Because they move fast uh, and they are probably able to hustle, you know, and like <laughs> just like find out their way somehow in like one, one to two quarters. Uh, but if you talk to a corporate, they will take easily, you know, uh, two to three quarters minimum. And I've seen that example in real life. And I've been on that side as well, you know, uh, as a founder. So um, this is what the challenge comes in when it comes to really working with you know, uh, a bank directly right, in terms of API integrations. Now, and you might have heard of, of course, you know, the new age API banking platforms or uh, more commonly called the banking as a service platforms right, that are coming into the country, not just India again, broadly across the world, but yes, India like, is catching up uh, the pace pretty rapidly. Um, and I think a lot of that is driven by not just the you know uh, demand of course which we saw a few of these major categories in the first slide you know which are really pulling uh, you know founders to think about these vast products and build them um, but also from the supply side right at the same time you have these plethora of uh, banking institutions uh, NBFCs as well and other financial institutions you know uh, in the country that are opening up their data sources right they're really coming out and saying okay hey you know sure we realize that our data is valuable we're not able to do a good job at exposing, and not just data, by the way, like pretty much everything that they have in terms of payments, in terms of issuing a card, in terms of creating a bank account, all of those functionalities and capabilities um, that they have, and they're not able to expose it in a nice way. They realize that the BAS players can come in and take that software headache out of the window. You know? Let the BAS players essentially develop that developer-friendly documentation, developer-friendly platform that the bank is not able to do. Okay? Um, and this is how the best players or the API players operate, right? So they connect with a plethora of banks, and many of these could be you know, connecting with NBFCs as well. Uh, some of these are actually working in the insurance domain. I'm not sure if you have heard of them, uh, but there are a lot of players that are working with insurance companies in the background, you know, and TPAs and hospitals in the front end. But yeah, restricting ourselves to banking from a private banking perspective, uh, this is where we look at you know the current, uh, I would say, the Indian fintech scene uh, emerging in the next, I would say, five to ten years. This is where it could be like, and I'm sure uh, the techies among you or the developers among you will realize that this is very similar to uh, someone like say, AWS, right? Uh, in AWS, for example, I think what happens is if I am a developer, a new developer who's you know uh, starting a company or you know a developer in an existing company launching a new product, um, and I want to use AWS, right? So what I do is I sign up on the website. It's just a two-minute job. Um, once I'm authenticated, I have the choice to use the modules that I want to use. Right? So it's pretty modular and like I would say 
uh, seamless to use right, from a um, integration perspective. So I just go there and I decide, okay, I want to use you know, EC2 for my uh, you know, uh, instance running. Uh, then I want to use S3 for hosting static files. Uh, and I want to use RDS, for example, for a database, right, or whatever, like right, the multiple modules that I can choose from. So that whole integration and just that understanding will probably take you half an hour, one hour max, right? Like even if, um, especially if I'm new to, you know, AWS. If I'm not new, then of course it's just a five minute job. Um, and then once I'm done with that, right, the sandbox is so easy to play with that pretty much within that next two, three hour window, I can have my product up and running on a fully functional instance at any scale in any corner of the world. Right? Now that is the thing that we are seeing will come to banking eventually. Right? What that means is, as a company, again, imagine those examples, you know, on the private sector side, which are catering to individuals, retailers, aggregators, right? Um, these companies, the developers of these companies, coming onto the platforms of, you know, an API banking or a BAS player right now as well. Uh, of course, right now we are early, you know, in the early stages of this journey, the entire BAS journey in India, but yes, in, say, in the next one year, this will become normal, right? You come into that platform, you sign up, and you choose, okay, hey, I need KYC. Right, because I need to onboard my customers as a Zomato. Um, then I need, uh, you know, I need to issue prepaid cards to my delivery boys, right, to help them with easy expense management. So I need your cards more. Easy. Then I'm thinking of opening a new bank account, right, for all my customers and giving them extra, extra benefits uh, on my platform right, for signing up on that bank account and then spending using that bank account. And those benefits can be shared between the bank, you know, and the company. This will become extremely normal. Right. Um, for those of you who are really in fintech, this will already feel now. <laughs> you know, if you would have seen a couple of examples. Um, so now, if you look at that analogy, right, the AWS analogy, you can you can look at a, an entire decentralized future where you have these banks, which essentially become commodities of capital, right, and commodities of trust, because for sure they have the licensing and they have capital, so we have to work with them. Um, but ultimately, the entire experience um, from an API perspective, right, and a software integration cycle perspective, is driven by a third party, which is this API banking platform. Right? So, um, yeah, this is you know how, uh, in our perspective, and definitely in my perspective, APIs are going to influence the private banking side, you know, uh, in the country. Now, we talked about the time, right? Um, let's talk a bit about the cost for because people might think, okay, hey, you know, okay, sure. Uh, you might save time, you know, by bypassing a direct integration with a bank. You might save like six months, twelve months, uh, but you might maybe spend more if you integrate with somebody in the middle. Again, take that as an AWS analogy, right? So it's very, like I would say, uh, comparable both from a time of integration and the cost of integration perspective. If you integrate with AWS, the cost is not that high, right? Uh, it's actually quite low, right? of course, depending on the scale. Um, in the long term. What you save on is not just the cost of integration. You also save the cost of maintenance, right? Um, and this just, just again, does not just include the maintenance of, you know, maintaining your own servers, maintaining your own black space, uh, maintaining your own, you know, hosting requirements, all of that which gets taken care of by AWS. Again, same analogy on the banking side. If you're doing um, integrations directly, these individual modules from the banks and KYC, which might be from some you know, government provider. Uh, you will have to do the maintenance, right? Maintenance in terms of API breakdown, any updates, any iterations, any new versions that happen, and relying on one single bank provider. That is the biggest risk of all, right? Because it, we could again go to a black swan event, right? Where RBI might clamp down on any of the private banks and keeps on happening uh, if you're know, uh, in touch with the news. So keeping all these aspects in mind, right? The overall expense actually comes out to be 80% lower, right? again. Considering the one-time set of fees, your developer costs, maintenance, integration, all of that. So, both from this perspective, right, uh, the future looks like a very tightly coupled future with the third-party software platform taking care of the entire headache, not just the headache of the company which is integrating with the bank, but also the headache of the bank, right? Because the bank at the end of the day is also spending, you know, six to eight months the same time that you are spending on the integration side. They are deploying their resources as well, you know, from maintenance perspective. So it's not just a win for the company, it's a win for the bank as well. And if you look at the reduced time of integration, right, because now it goes down to two to three weeks with the typical platform, then the bank is happy as well. Right? Hey, ultimately, they are saving time and money. Right? So they are also able to reduce that cost and also acquire the same, you know, uh, sorry, 10 times more customer actually uh, in the same duration as they were doing earlier. 
Now let's take a, an example workflow, right? So let's take how um, APIs are essentially influencing gig economy players, right? To look at this new side of private banking. Um, if you look at uh, a typical gig economy player, right? Again, um, let's consider a domestic one, someone who is who has developed a freelancing platform, right? Uh, and there are hundreds and thousands of freelancers that are um, listed on that platform and they're working on the platform. They have their early dates up and all of that. Uh, and people can book a freelancer, you know, our freelancer can choose a job you know, that he wants. Um, now, in this case, the the typical tendency of the gig economy platform is not really to think about financial services, right? Because that's not the core thing that he started out with. But the money flow that flows in is his you know, earning cycle. That's where he really earns the money. So by default, um, every company, and in this case, a gig economy platform for sure, has to think about earning money through financial services. Right? So this is where the classic quotation, and this is where, and you might have heard of this quotation in a lot of places, is every company will eventually become a fintech company. So this is the reason why they say that, because for this company to really scale in terms of revenue, not just users, in terms of revenue, um, they have to use, you know, give some use case of financial services, right? Uh, a new financial instrument like card, a bank account, uh, an instrument to invest the money, right? which the freelancer is earning, uh, save the money, give them some fixed deposits, you know, multiple array of products that they can offer from a financial services perspective. And uh, yeah, in order to do that, you know, these guys definitely have to connect with some of the private banking players because you know, public banking, uh, not everybody prefers public banking, uh, and especially freelancers don't really prefer you know, public bank accounts. So um, yeah, now if you take this into a larger perspective and apply that across, you know, all kinds of gig economy players, not just you know, uh, freelance platforms, uh, you can see uh, an Uber offering the driver right a better credit cycle, um, or even paying off you know uh, some salary in advance based on his credit history or his financial behavior, or of course they would already have data of his driving behavior, you know, so on and so forth. And yeah, so this can be like you know one example flow for this company to really connect with the private banking world through an API banking platform. Right. Oh, right. uh, yeah. You know, you can see a similar example across gaming. Right? So this gamer comes in, you know, he comes onto the company, he signs up, you know, uh, he has uh, already been playing a few games. So he knows that, okay, this is like, I've already linked my bank account. This is where I need to, this is from where I need to pay the money you know, for any in-app purchases. Um, and then in order to influence the gamer to play more and more, right, I'm sure gaming companies deploy all these cashback tactics, you know, and so other tactics. They're giving them better financial instruments, right, uh, can also be, a great way to add revenue for the gaming company. Uh, and I'm sure some of you would have already tried out you know, some of these new age games in the US, which have already started doing. So yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's pretty much it from my side. Uh, you know, open to questions. Thanks a lot, Rohit, for an amazing session. And like I said initially, I think it really ties up well with the previous session, which we cast delivered from the standard chartered perspective. And I think uh, what you elaborated very beautifully in terms of the API banking or open banking with respect to the Indian context is definitely is indeed the future, because I think it will decentralize the control and will also bring all products on one platform at competitive prices. And then in turn, this would uh, make banking much cheaper. But I do have a couple of questions related sure. to it. So there has been some concerns that are, I think should be better addressed beforehand, like we are moving really fast in terms of the API's adoption with respect to the banking domain. And one of them has been uh, data privacy, because I think, uh, uh, many of the best APIs are those that handle transfer lots of rich data, meaning uh, proper security protocols and compliance certifications, which are really vital. And uh, uh, with respect to the proper assessments, I think without proper assessment or an understanding of good design for security, businesses can accidentally expose sensitive information or unintentionally open themselves up to malicious inputs, compliance violations, and much more. So one is the data privacy. So from your perspective, would like to know what do you think we could do from the Indian context better in terms to 
manage or in terms to counter that. And the second point which is there is in terms of the consolidation of services. So what would happen if only a few platforms are able to take control of all the services? Mm -hmm. So I think sure. as part of the eventuality, small banks would perish from the com competition if that kind of consolidation happens. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to know uh, more from uh, uh, in terms of from your thoughts and perspective around that as well. Sure, sure. Uh, no, absolutely. I think uh, like privacy uh, and security is something which is paramount, right? And um, more so in the fintech world, in the banking world uh, than anywhere else. Um, in fact, uh, I think if you look at um, the way cloud has evolved, um, and it has, of course, I mean, just been a few decades, you know, and most people don't realize that, um, like as compared to the mainframe storage, which used to happen uh, you know, earlier. And in fact, most of the banks, even now, uh, definitely in India as well, they still have uh, storage, uh, you know, on the hub. Like they actually use hard disks, uh, and they maintain that in-house. Right. Um, so the cloud does pose like an initial, I would say, worry. You know, and this is the thing. This is the like term that um, most, like I would say, people from the financial background, right, who have been in the industry for the last twenty or thirty years, uh, they think. And it is I would definitely I would say something to notice. It doesn't mean that we should discard that. Um, but I think cloud has come so fast in such a short duration of like a few decades um, that people are not really noticing the other side of it, which is the security changes right that it has gone through, uh, and the network protocols and the layers that we use on the network side, right? Uh, the encryption standards, the way they have evolved, you know, over the last uh, twenty or thirty years. People miss out on that just because of that, you know, initial prejudice that okay, uh, the cloud is insecure, right? Or maybe the moment we send it out to the system towards somebody else's cloud, it's insecure. Sure, it can be insecure, but can be is the key. Right? So it doesn't mean it is. Um, so through proper audits, we have seen, and you know, we work with, of course, multiple banks, multiple you know, uh, institutions uh, on the lending side and BSCs as well. So we've seen that uh, trend change a lot. Um, and definitely, I would say this is where uh, I am proud of the way you know Indian banks have responded, you know, to some extent. That uh, like uh, they are definitely adopting and moving faster when it comes to uh, cloud networks, you know, storage, uh, or just moving data through the cloud, um, which has not been the case in a lot of countries, by the way. So, yeah, from that perspective, I would say you know, like, as long as we keep an eye on the positive side of it, and of course, make sure that you know uh, both the protocols on the bank side and the fintech side are taken care of, and there are proper audits, uh, you know, both penetration testing and everything, uh, which keeps on happening when you integrate with the bank. Those are taken care of, should be fine. Um, with regards to the second one, you know, which you mentioned of course, validation uh, of the banks. In fact, I see the opposite, right? So, by default, that consolidation is already present, like. Right? There are already uh, seven to eight major private banks, you know, which pretty much have 80 to 90% market share in the country. Um, and that is bound to be there in every country, right? You always have power law. Um, uh, so I think the, it's actually the other way around which the platforms will encourage. The platforms will actually encourage the existing banks, which really have a strong market share, to continue to grow in the segment that they're strong in. And different banks have different focus areas. Right? So you'll find banks that are really focusing heavily on SMEs. Uh, then you will find banks that are really focusing heavily on the retail side, right? the individuals just acquiring them. Um, so I think that will continue to happen because at a particular moment, it's very hard for a big institution like a bank to focus on multiple things at the same time. Right? Um, so yeah, we will see different banks, especially smaller banks, uh, really come in strong, try to build out their tech infrastructure fast, uh, learn from the incumbents, you know, uh, and also take one of these verticals, you know, could be like NRE, NRI's deposit, multiple verticals, uh, and just focus on that. Yeah. Right, Rohit. And once again, really appreciate a detailed explanation and answer sure. because I think both of these topics are still evolving in terms of addressing the right solution, and it will keep on evolving as part of the rapid adoption which is happening across the industry. And I do have a follow up question uh, related to it as well because I think. There is a significant difference when it comes to public banking and private banking, because private banking is more agile. They want to adapt to new technologies more readily as compared to public banking, which have lots of legacy system, which yeah. makes it more challenging for them. 
So from your own perspective, what do you think the public bank should do? Because some of the banks like SBI have already done lots of transformation, which is quite aligned with what private banks are doing. So some of the key takeaways you can share from your perspective so that public banks and private bankings are more or less aligned in their rapid sure. option. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think for the public bank, the oversight is, you know, the hardest thing. So they are always in the scrutiny, um, much more than the private banks. Um, so like what I would really suggest, um, say, for example, if there's a new public sector bank, new in the sense, like relatively new, you know, over the past five years or so, um, they have, I would say, a significant advantage in terms of potential agility that they can have. Um, and I'm not sure if you know, they have really taken advantage of. It. So that is something which I would really urge them to you know, uh, take advantage of uh, as a small company. Um, what that means is they will definitely need to move faster and they can move faster due to that ability uh, of being smaller. So just just moving faster purely on the infrastructure, like the core infrastructure, uh, like forget about API, just your core infrastructure of money movement, right? IMPS, NEFT, UPI, uh, RTGS, all of that. Making that extremely strong and reliable and thinking of it from a first principle perspective, like developer you know, friendly perspective, uh, that when we expose this, because eventually you will have to expose these APIs, you know, uh, externally. So when you expose it, your core infra should be designed in such a way that it is ready for that exposure, you know, and it is ready to handle that scale. Um, and also, of course, the security standards that you're mandated to follow. Um, I think that is where uh, the smaller public sector banks or the ones that are yet to digitize themselves can do a much better job. Right. Absolutely. So once again, Rohit, thanks for again answering all these questions and detailing everything, I think, which makes a lot of sense for the audience. And uh, it, it is a privilege and an honor to have you as part of our speaker lineup. And we are really hoping that we would be able to see you next time as well. So once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit.